Energietransponder sind etwas, die werden RFID Transponders are used pretty extensively these days. Pretty much every one of you uses them for some type of uh, they're especially uh, popular as access control systems. This talk is about uh, transponders that are used for non-mission critical uses, like uh, automation of laundry. But some of the, some people may think that if it works well there, we might as well just use it somewhere else. Das ist natürlich ein bisschen mutig. Well, that's kind of daring sometimes, but our speakers had a look if they can attack the system or transfer the knowledge they gained from attacked systems that have been broken in the past to new ones. And they will show us why it's a bad idea to use the high tech as for access control systems. So give us a welcoming applause for our talkers, Ralf Spenneberg, Ozan Cicek. Yeah, hello. Hello. I'm happy to be here. I'm Ralf Spenneberg. This is Ozan. The third guy is unfortunately ill and couldn't make it. But with three people on the stage, it would have been a little ridiculous for the 30 minutes we have anyway. So let's have a look. We do uh, pen testing, security analysis, and obviously RFID systems. Why are we interested in this? A couple of things for the background. The, guy, the people among you who know these type of systems, the ones where you pay in the canteen or for key systems or wireless payment, for example, they usually use some type of transponder technology. And depending on the frequency that the transponders use, there are three commonly used um, areas in the spectrum. The high frequency, low frequency, and the ultra high frequency transponders. We only use the low frequency ones. Those are used first and foremost in places where you need a very um, close contact. Their reach is rather short and they usually are very low powered. So you can even, if you have a passively powered transponder, then you cannot do a lot of calculation, for example. This may be different for high frequency transponders. With the low frequency transponders, you can only solve this problem by using an active transponder that has its own power source. Low and high frequency transponders are used in uh, uh, access control systems, for example, for doors. Ultra high frequency ones are used for um, systems where you need a very high distance that you can bridge, for example, in logistics. High frequency is usually libraries, laundromats. The high tech S is a 125 kilohertz transponder. There's three different varieties, the 32, 256, and 2048-bit. There's a authentication mechanism built in. It has a 48-bit key, and the password is 24-bit. That's obviously easily to decrypt. This password is saved in the key itself, with which the transponder can identify itself. And it uses an undocumented uh, decryption cipher. It, uh, it, uh, it is unbroken so far as we know, or at least it counts as such. And we looked at it and we knew of a broken system and tried to transfer what we learned there to this high-tech S. Well, why did we do it? In our own building, we had an RFID access control for the doors. And it was used in, it was built in 2007, and we always had a bad feeling about it. And we thought about it for a while, and 
looked at it and we actually broke it pretty bad, told the manufacturer about it and they actually fixed it for the January 1st, 2016 and will uh, publish a paper that details what exactly was broken and what they had to fix and how we broke it. So we looked for an alternative and looked at other access control systems from other manufacturers and the manufacturer also uh, advertised the system as unbroken so far because it had the high tag. Well, let's talk about the access control systems for a start. Um, there's two different types, online and offline. The online one is you basically touch the, the key, it sends a signal to it and the, the, uh, the lock actually communicates with a server and tries to identify you. Here you only send some identification number and that is used. So basically all you need to do is you need to send this, uh, this ID and the manufacturer guarantees that this ID is unique. Um, sometimes there's uh, access control systems that have high frequency transponders that also have the authentication of the transponder, you, that use the authentication of the transponder. Offline uh, access control systems are like the one we have in our building and that are used in this case. They save the authentication on the tag. So if I can uh, read the tag and write it again and and the uh, 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 information isn't very secure, I can even change the uh, authentication of a tag. But with a lot of uh, systems, that's uh, actually the case because they, they have uh, very awful bugs. And, and there are some advisories about this. And that's also uh, the case with the high tag S. So if I can read the transponder and emulate it, I can uh, copy a key. So the problem is that that's usual. Sometimes you can just you uh, do that um, while you walk past someone. So if somebody has their key in their back pocket, I can read the key because they might not be using a RFID shield. So you can make a copy of their key very easily. So you, a transponder should uh, should make sure that that doesn't happen. I uh, give the word to Osan. The first thing we did was we had a look at the authentication. That's what happens between the reader and the tag. So every transponder in, in the reach um, Every transponder um, uh, responds with their 32-bit ID, and then the um, reading device sends a the sends a select ID, and then the the and then they get all, get all the information by that chip. Which size does the transponder have? Does it want to authenticate? Which data may I write or read? And which modulation is used? Which speed is used? Uh, all those information can be read out of the communi uh, configuration from the chip. When you read, it wants to authenticate, and the read-write module is, goes ahead, takes a 30-bit uh, random number, they generate some secret data, and the 30-bit data or is uh, com communicated to the transponder as a challenge. If the has the same secret data, then the read and write key knows the key. So now the transponder contacts the three password bytes and the configuration byte and sends it to the reader device. If the reader device can decrypt it and reads the password, they have authenticated to each other. Afterwards, the unsecured data connection can be established. The next question is, 
how is the secret data uh, um, thought and how is it encrypted and decrypted? If you look at the memory layout and look at the already broken transponder, then you can see large differences, especially there where the configuration bytes are. And the password and the key is also saved differently. Additionally, with the data bank, uh, the read-write module that want to authenticate has a special code. It's called the FLIPS HDA130, and it's all used by all the high-tech specific uh, techs. And we have looked at it more specifically, and especially the commando uh, service, and we want to see which commands can be sent to the coprocessor. And there are specific commands for the high tech 1, 2, and S. However, there is no high tech S specific commands to write uh, data to the EEPROM. So we can assume that there are similarly, similar as commands as the, with the others. In addition, the co processor that is used as three different transponder has very unlikely two, three completely different ciphers. So we have assumed uh, that the cipher from HiTech S is similar or the same as hi with HiTech 2. HiTech 2 cipher is already known for a couple of years and it has been published. It looks like this. Basically, there are two things one, a non linear, two linear, uh, two step function and an 8-bit shift register. One of the properties of the cipher will be used in the following attacks and that is, if you look at the initialization of the cipher, you can recognize that the out bits will only be used after the beginning has been used. So first we have to put an initial data in the um, uh, register. So we do that by putting the 32-bit UID of the user and the last 18 bits of the key and initialize the cipher with that. So the shift register is initialized to that, and it's shifted 32 times, and the last place on the right is always updated. And when I have 16 bit of the key in an 18 bit shift register and shift 32 times, they will not fall out in the initial pl uh, situation. They are still in the first place. So what they've done with this cipher, they've used the Proxima, that is a tool, RFID tool, and we have implement the HTSF cipher with this cipher and we have created an, a, a transponder in the motors with the key we know and then it was possible to authenticate as a high-tech S system so that's we know now we know that it's exactly the same cipher the cipher wasn't used for the same thing, but it's the similar. It's the same. So, f in the first of all, we need some hardware. So we have the Proxmax 3. That's a, a general purpose RFID tool, so it can do low as well as high frequency RFID chips. And we have some software for that. For example, a reader and a write device, and an emulator to to look if we want to have broken a key to emulate a transponder. So, for the, re the first attacks, maybe there is the possibility of a relay attack. If you remember, in the authentication, we only have one random number, and that is decided upon by the read-write device. So if an attacker reads the complete communication, for example, with the product smart, he can send the challenge uh, code again to the transponder, and the transponder just answers. Because as a attacker, I can just can't decrypt his uh, information in, in his password. But with this simple re attack, I can run the same the same codes as a read-write device. Then Ralph has talked about it before. Technology is a bit crazy. Brute force attacks. It's an 84 bit key. The cipher is not really complicated. If you put in a couple of servers, you can calculate the key within a couple of weeks. Another attack, and that's an attack, especially hit high tech 2, and it's run and gone in 360 seconds using the 2012. 
and it has 120 challenges. And if once I have them, I just need five minutes for the attack. It's just a mathematical calculation, and it uses a different issue of the cipher. We are not going to talk about further. And then there is a more design issue on their side. Uh, you can, if you look at the configuration bits, there are three bits that are especially interesting. The out bit. If th in that case the uh, transponder wants to authenticate, if the Alcun print, the Alcun cannot be changed. And lock key and password uses uh, the key uh, protects the key and the password from reading and writing, but you can choose them differently. So you can send transponders that want to communicate, but they also want to protect the assertions. But you can change the configuration with, and the configuration the transponder is not protected for that. About that for that. Another possible attack that's especially effective is uh, the set solver. Set solver with like crypto set or mini set is mathematically optimated algorithms that try to solve solutions that try to prove the um, satisfiability and with the example here, uh, set solver wants to try to find values a, b, and c to make it all true. The set solver originally come from the uh, electronics. But I can solve many solutions by that if I can change the problem into a formula. And that's exactly what we want to do. We want to say, hey, this is the set solver. Please build a formula and solve it. So first of all, before we start to create the formula, we need the key stream bits. How do we reach them? The first, the easiest thing is the easy data are the first 32 bits negated. So if I negate them back, I get the first 32 bits. Then. The con 2 bit is sent encrypted and not encrypted. So if I X all them, I've got the next eight bits. So I can, per authentication, get 40 key, be uh, key screen bits because I want to know the initial uh, state for 84 bits for with which I can calculate these bits. And the fewer bits I have, the higher the, uh, the probability is that the original state is wrong. The high tech too, that's not a problem because also the data communication is encrypted. I get much closer than 40 bits. How do we solve that with the high tech S? We take two ciphers, so two different encryptions, and read the key stream bits out of that as in above. And we always try to find the initial state for that. And then we use the options from the slide before. The initial state of the 16, first 16 bit from the key, and if I authenticate twice, there is no change. And you always say, hey, the first initial states are the same in the first 16 bits. This formula is created, and the set solvers solve it usually within five days, and the result is initial state, so 16 bit of the key. So, how do I get to the rest of the data? The key is 84 bits. I only have 16 of them. Well, brute force. The other 32 bits are not that large. And on the other hand, I can also do a rollback. What's a rollback? Well, the initial state is the state of the initialization. And in the initialization, there are three parameters. The random number, the UID, and the key. So I know the result, the UID, and the random number. And so n now I can calculate the only one that's unknown with the XOR. So I calculate the previous state with the uh, and get another key, and that's immediately. There are 32 operations, and once I have the key, that still doesn't mean that I have the can read all of the transponder because there are some. Uh, there's a bit that protects a key and the password. I do know the key, and the password was encrypted beforehand and it was run encrypted in the authentication. And know the key. If I have the complete transponder, I have the complete transponder, then I can um, emulate the transponder completely. For example, in the with this Proxmark 3, or you can also build your own thing. It's pretty simple, actually. So you need the the traces. Um, you need to collect the traces. You have to break the key with the set solver, and 
to to read all of the things from transponder and then you can uh, clone the transponder okay that means if I have a access control system and that uses this high tech uh, transponder that means you somebody could possibly uh, for example while I plug in the key uh, into the lock or if I have the transponder in front of the reader, they could read the authentication um, challenges while I do that. So, for example, f uh, with, uh, with the set solver, you need two um, uh, challenges or 150 for the cryptographical uh, attack. That means uh, you probably need uh, access to the to the reader to get all the 150 challenges, but that means that I could break the key that's used by this uh, this tag, and you can not only read the key but you can also read all the other data that this key has, and that means I can actually create a clone for the whole key, and so. If uh, if the other data on the key is not uh, properly secured, that means you could possibly um, extend the data and change the key to be one of uh, of the master keys that can access the more rooms. So we looked around for for uh, other systems for low frequency transponders, and most that we saw or all that we saw were already broken or. Uh, they used um, they use systems that are as easily broken as the as the ones we talked about. So the problem is that low frequency transponder don't have enough energy to use secure um, systems. So that means if you want to make a secure access control system, you need high frequency transponders. High frequency transponder doesn't mean that uh, that the system is secure. Uh, like, for example, the MyFair system, and that has broken as well. Has been broken as well. So, if you support the Desfire system, you can still use the MyFair Classic system. So, they the systems are backwards compatible. So, these are broken already. So, if it's been um, in access for, uh, in uh, in operation for eight years, it might still support the old standard. So the modern systems can be secure, but they don't have to be. So we looked around which um, which vendors actually use low frequency uh, or even the high tech S system, and a lot of them seem to do that. But that doesn't mean that uh, if your vendor is on this list that your system is necessarily uh, broken. Sometimes they also use alternatives, like for example. Uh, the Ullmann and Sucker um, system is also offered with high frequency transponders like uh, Desfire, but if you bought the low frequency um, system, if you bought the low frequency system, you can only use the high tag uh, tag and another one that is also uh, very insecure. And for the other one, the cloning of the transponder is actually trivial. So you only need to build a small uh, bit of hardware for 20, 25 euros, and you can you can uh, clone the key immediately. That and the clone is not is not distinguishable from the original. And there's no way to check who it really was. So if you if you talk to the vendors and you ask them how they can sell something like that, then they'll say, "Well, this has been it's seven years. It's been seven years, and we don't really see a need for, to inform our customers that this is insecure." Or they answered, "They answer, oh, we never said that this is secure." We don't do security, we do only do access systems. And then you go and look on the on the website and look for the word security and unsurprisingly it doesn't even um, exist on their website. So the question is now, did the vendor know this for a long time and they just uh, never told anyone 
I mean, the question is, where are all these systems deployed? Uh, hospitals, schools, are there any questions? Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to certainly uh, take more care with my uh, with my systems. We have five minutes for questions. If you have questions, please go to the to the microphones. An Mikrofon 3, das sehe ich eine Frage. Ja, eine Frage kann man dann. Uh, one question. Is, is there a way to, uh, uh, to uh, collect uh, pairs of challenges without having the key itself? No. Well, the point is. The reader has to believe that it actually talks to the transponder and has to send the transponder some data. If you have access to the transponder, i.e. The, the ID, if you can collect it with some certainty, then you can write, then you can build an emulator that pretends to be this key, and you can go to the to the reader and or to the tag and read the the challenge. But for once, at least, you need a valid ID that you need to find. Well, we actually found one system that actually didn't even uh, collect the IDs internally. You can probably just use any ID, but that's only one system. I read the CT magazine and there was a, an article uh, about Mercedes that are open via relay uh, attacks. So, for example, somebody is driving by uh, the streetcar. Well, we didn't try it, but it's trivially easy with the transponder. So, there's no timing attacks. Um, will you release the Proxmark software? Yeah, I believe. Yeah, at least parts of it, but yeah, I think so. Well, NXP is actually the manufacturer behind this, and they have been contacted by us by four or five months ago. We didn't get an answer, and then we repeated the contract maybe 40 days ago. NXP knows about it, and they contacted their customers. If there's a customer here that actually uses these parts in their systems, well, don't trust the EDIDT of the customers. If it's critically important for your application, then your application is broken anyway. Well, just a, just a fact, these uh, locking systems actually depends on, f uh, they're, they're actually made up of about 500,000 uh, locks. Kommt noch eine Frage aus dem Internet. Gut, für eine haben wir noch Zeit, bitte. Um, könnte man, wenn man Could you, Kommunikation aufzeichnen will, um, if you record all the communication, could you actually use um, sound uh, sound interfaces for this? Keine Ahnung. Actually, I don't know. Never tried. Well, we used oscilloscopes. Aber if the sound card is good enough to resolve the 125 kilohertz, then it's probably possible. It will be doable. You probably have to look at emulation. It's probably not easy, but yeah. Okay. Give us an applause. Thanks for this talk.